through this. Um, I'm Nicole Fortrin. I'm director of organizational performance and analytics at Jeff. I'm also a research affiliate at Clemson University, which is mostly a fun way of saying that I really like data. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about how DevOps is a key to organizational um, and IT performance. Um, because I really love stories, but the plural of anecdote is in data. I love stories, I love hearing about the transformations that I see in the industry all over the place, but it's really hard when like, we go to executives and managers and we tell them about this amazing thing that I heard at this company, this other place, and they're like, super cool, super not gonna work here. Who hears about that before? No? Yeah, right? It's easy hands. Okay. And some of this comes back to this amazing article that was written by Nicholas Carr in 2003. It was in Harvard Business Review, and the title of this paper was IT Doesn't Matter. This sucked. Because every executive read, like, reads Harvard Business Review, and they're like, super IT doesn't matter. So suddenly, IT is a cost center. Who hears heard this? Everyone, right? And we've all heard it way too many times. And so suddenly it was like technology just doesn't matter, right? Like we're gonna deal with it because we need to deal with it, and that's it. So this is where we're going to, this is the whole point of this talk is, we're gonna talk about why IT does matter, and we're gonna talk about how times have changed and IT has changed, okay? DevOps is good for organizations, DevOps is good for IT, and then we'll dig into some of the detail lines and talk about what drives this change. And we need to have three key components to really make a difference here. We need to have technical practices, we need to have some process around it, and we need to have culture. But we have to have all three of them in order to make this work and in order to make it stick. If we only have one and not the other two, it just doesn't work, right? If we only implement technology and not the other two, this is going to feel and look a lot like the 80s and 90s when like companies were just implementing like massive ERP systems and not doing anything else. And they were surprised when it didn't like massively change things. Right? This probably sounds familiar. Or if we only do the process and suddenly have our meetings standing up instead of sitting down and nothing else changes, it doesn't do anything. Or if we only fix the culture and we have like pizza on Fridays but nothing else changes, that also doesn't make a difference. Okay, we need to have all three. I'll talk about why. So We know that if we only implement technology, it just doesn't make a big difference in organizations. And we know this, you know, Nicholas Carr said, you know, IT doesn't matter. And it's because for years and for decades, organizations spent money on IT. But it was because, you know, I can, I can buy IT, plug it in, I can throw it in a closet, I can give it really pretty uplighting. By the way, this is Facebook, right? This is Facebook's cost center. But my competition can do the exact same thing, right? My competitors can buy the same server or competitor server, they can do the same thing. It gives us a point of parity, but not a point of distinction. So that's what they call it, right? It helps us keep up, it doesn't help us get ahead. So we have to have all three components in order to really make a difference, right? We have to include the whole organization, we have to include the value chain, we have to do this with an eye toward business value. And then it suddenly makes a difference. And so I'll be talking about the research that I did um, over the last several years with Gene Kim and Jess Humble. And we're looking at um, data points with technology teams um, around the world. We have over 20,000 data points, in some cases 25,000 data points from several teams. And so if you go back to your organization, if you go back to your managers and they say, oh, this, doesn't just, this just doesn't work for me, it totally does. So we're looking at um, industry verticals across several places, right? Retail, enterprise, technology, financial services. This, this really holds. Um, this has also been published in peer review. So uh, we see evidence several places. So when people ask me what I mean when I talk about DevOps, what I mean when I this right, everyone's like, oh, there's no definition. Well, when I talk about DevOps, I'm talking about technical practices, um, that focus in on continuous delivery, and I'll talk about what I mean when I say continuous delivery. Management practices seen in uh, lean management principles, and organizational culture and identity. 
And research shows that these drive IT performance and organizational performance. Okay, so let's go ahead and cut to the chase. DevOps is good for organizations. And when I say that, I mean high performing organizations. So when I like throw the data in the pot and I say, okay, what do I mean when I say high IT performing organizations? I'll get to IT performance in just a second. But I say, um, when I compare the high performers to the low performers, the high performers are twice as likely to exceed profitability, productivity, and market share. And for those that are publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, um, they see 50% higher market cap growth over the previous three years. This came from the 2014 um, study. The 2015 and the 2016 study didn't have um, high enough data rates for me to uh, do a statistical analysis. But this is showing up in the data for the overall organization. So Nicholas Carr, good second, right? IT does matter at the overall organizational level around the world. So uh, this just has the asterisk because this was only for publicly traded companies, but the 2x more likely to exceed profitability, productivity, market share. This holds true for all companies. So that's awesome. So for anyone who just see, he only needed proof that it it mattered for companies. He's out. <laughs> that's right. That's awesome. Okay. So also DevOps is good for IT. What do I mean when I say IT performance? I'm talking about throughput and stability. This is how I measure it. And there are a few reasons that I count these two measures. So throughput and stability. When I talk about throughput, I'm talking about deploy frequency and lead time for changes. I include two different measures here. For, um, deploy frequency, lead time for changes. I also have two different measures for stability. MTTR, lead time to recover, and change fail rate. Now there's a couple different reasons I use these two measures. One is that it speaks really well to the two different um, groups that we tend to speak about here, right? We, we talk about the, the traditional ops crowd, right? Their role in life is to introduce changes in code as quickly as possible. Does it sound familiar? We've seen some heads. Now the other group that we tend to talk about here is, is the ops crowd, right? They want to keep the infrastructure up, right? They want stability, they want to limit code and changes, right? So MTTR and change fail rate. So these measures are good because it speaks to the two crowds, right? They're also really nice because these two sets of measures are in tension to each other. It's really hard to gain one set of metrics without gaming the other, okay? So these are also really good here. So when I talked about high performers versus low performers, I threw all of these metrics, like, just in a bucket, right? I threw them all in statistically and I said, like, let them all fall. How do they fall into groups? The high performers tend to be very, very good at all of them. So they all load together, they all cluster together, it's called cluster analysis. They're all similar to each other and dissimilar to the other groups. There was also a medium performer group that were all similar to each other and different from other groups. The low performers were all similar to each other and dissimilar from the other groups. They fell into three groups. Oh, I'm super creative, so I call them high performers, medium performers, and low performers. You'll notice that I said the high performers were all really good at all of them. The low performers were all really bad at all of them. And the medium performers were all hanging out in the middle at all of them. This is an important point. For years, we've kind of been told that in order to be stable, you have to kind of slow down. I don't see it anywhere in the data. Three years now, over 20,000 teams, I don't see trade-offs. I just don't see it. So that's also super cool, I think. But I like data. So, got it nerd. So, here's what we see. High performing DevOps teams, so those high performers compared to those low performers. High performers are more agile. I see 200 times more frequent deployments, and they move faster. Over 2,500 shorter lead times, code commit to code deploy. So when you think about moving fast, making changes, getting code to market, being able to pivot, this is a compelling, compelling story. <coughs> also, when we talk about being more reliable, those high performers compared to those low performers, I see 24 times faster recovery from failure. And three times lower change fail rate. So when I introduce any type of change to the system, 
any kind of service incident, outage, not even a full um, failure of the system, any kind of service incident, it's three times lower change failure. So DevOps promises and actually delivers more throughput, more stability, and it's in tandem without the trade-offs that ITIL implies or calls for. Right? We don't have to have these change windows. We don't have to have these two-week waits. So let's talk about what it means for us, right? So we're more agile. We're faster. So think about what this means for us and all of our teams and our businesses. These are really compelling when we go to our executives and we go to our managers. What does it mean for new content delivery? Beating our competitors to market. Value and savings around A-B testing. Value around speed to market. Now, let's consider a world where we don't have competitors. There are times when I give this talk with people that there's someone in the back, and it's always, always a guy. Some guy in the back is like, I don't have a competitor. I work for a government, and I don't have a competitor. I'm like, okay, maybe you don't have a competitor, but you always have to deal with regulatory situations, security regulations. There's always something we have to deal with. Being able to address that quickly will always serve you well. So um, Ronnie Kahavi is at Microsoft. He was at Google for years. And speaking of A-B testing and being able to do experiments, um, because we always think we have the solution. We know exactly what our customers need, especially the people in, in suits at our companies. Right? Suits and, and dresses, they always know exactly what our customers need and what our customers want. <clears throat> Turns out we are not very good at knowing what our customers want. So the ability to test and understand what our customers want and pivot quickly serves us very well. Um, Ronnie Kahavi said, evaluating well-designed and executed experiments that were designed to improve a key metric, only about one-third were successful in improving that key metric. So if we have the ability to test that quickly in our code, and then pivot and redeploy code that can address that, so it's very, very well. So let's also talk about reliability in our code. If our code is more reliable, what does this mean for value and savings around reliability and uptime? Um, we also have compliance and security, or even just reputation around uptime, compliance, security. Um, Mary this morning spoke about Southwest and Delta going down in the United States. That was a big deal. They just went down for a few hours and they impacted flights around the world for days. Um, several years ago, um, Amazon went down and it affected everyone for hours. Um, are you guys familiar with this story? And Netflix did not go down. There was a big conspiracy theory that said that Netflix didn't go down because they were the biggest customer, so they had special cash. They had special servers that were only for Netflix. They did have some degraded servers, and you couldn't rate your favorite movies. There was some limited search functionality. Turns out, they did go down for Netflix. Netflix didn't even notice for a few hours because of Chaos Monkey. They had been prepared, they were ready, they didn't even declare a set one incident for five hours. Um, when Heartbleed came out, uh, the two most affected properties were um, the Canadian Tax Agency and a major hospital in North America. Um, an executive at the hospital said fixing it as soon as possible or having compensating controls in place days before could have saved this entire breach from occurring in the first place. Notice he said days before. They knew about this two weeks before it happened, but they couldn't respond in time. Okay, so up to this point, we know that IT performance is throughput and stability. Both are possible without trade-offs. We know that IT performance contributes to organizational performance. So the big question is, what drives IT and organizational performance? I'm sure we all want to know how to like do the thing. How do we fix this? So, stated another day, another way, we know what IT performance is. Step one. Step two, question mark. Step three, profit. I love you guys. <laughs> so here's what we found. 
continuous delivery makes our work better. Uh, this is what we found in the uh, 2015 study. The way we can read this model is the factors on the left are what make up continuous delivery. And, and this was the first iteration of the study. So we know that comprehensive, fast, reliable test and deployment automation, so test automation, deployment automation is an important part. Also, test-based development um, and continuous integration is an important part. And putting all of our production artifacts in version control. All of these are important pieces. From here, we know that continuous delivery leads to higher IT performance, which in turn contributes to higher organizational performance. Um, we also know that this decreases deployment pain. I don't know about you, but like pushing deploy and having that panic hit your gut is not fun. Right? So it's important that continuous delivery makes our work better, but it also makes our work feel better. Um, here's an example from Yahoo. We never had testability before, we have it now. We have this experience, we know it's working and it's working with controls. They have automation, um, automated configuration deployment of 250,000 nodes. They can deploy up to 140,000 node configs in eight hours. They can patch the entire infrastructure within six hours of a patch being made available. Uh, by the way, here's, here's without added math. This is from a um, uh, peer review paper. We were also able to find and add um, a path to burnout. So we also see decreases in burnout. Um, um, and added a path to organizational culture, which I'll talk about in just a minute. I was really excited when I uh, bumped into uh, someone from Microsoft who had a fantastic <coughs> example of implementing continuous delivery and finding a really good example of improving that decrease in burnout and that decrease um, in, or that increase kind of in, in work-life balance. So they, this came from a talk of, from DevOps Days London in 2016. They implemented CD, and what they found was, so you can't quite see it in the little screen cap there, but before CD, their work-life scores were 38%, and after CD, it jumped up to 75%. So it really does just make your life better. It makes it feel better. So we, we iterated on this, we made it a little bit better, right? So research kind of have to take baby steps at a time. So the 2016 study, we added effective test data management, we added trunk-based development, and we added incorporating security, and so shifting left on security. Does this actually help? Some of these were actually pretty controversial. A lot of people just didn't believe that trunk-based development was going to be an important part, um, and they really didn't think that shifting left on security would help. They know that security is important, but they were worried it would slow down the process. <clears throat> Turns out it doesn't, um, if you do it the right way. Um, what this does, um, it leads to um, less rework, which is important. Um, several of the other things that we found, lower levels of deployment pain, it improves our organizational culture, which again, I'll, I'll get to in just a second. Um, higher IT performance, identifying a strong way the organization can work for, um, which again, I'll, I'll chat about in just a second. And several of these things, again, contribute to higher organizational performance, which our businesses really, really care about. So, what else drives IT performance? <coughs> our lean management practices. So in 2015, we focused on lean management core practices of using effective WIP limits, which by the way, is one of the rare leading indicators in software development and delivery. There aren't very many here, so that's a really good one. Another one was the use of visual displays to monitor quality, productivity, and WIP. Um, and another one is the use of monitoring tools to make business decisions. The key there is making business decisions. So this is not like using pagers to wake you up in the middle of the night. Um, this contributes to higher IT performance, decreased burnout, and making a better organizational culture at work. A good example of visual displays here is Etsy. Um, Mike Robetsy at the time was VP of operations at Etsy, and he said, if it was graphic, um, they have some fantastic tools there that contribute to this great culture where um, every time you see a vertical line there is a time that they pushed code. So you can push your code, you can take a look at a graph, and you can see if the graph moved. And if it moved in a way that was expected, you can go on with your day. If it moved in a way that isn't expected, you can go back, take a look, make sure you haven't done something different. Another thing you can do is, when you're done with your work for the day, you can go take a look at this wall of graphs, or at least the portion of the wall of graphs that pertains to the work that you do. And if something is looking a little different, because we know that sometimes you know the work builds up, 
um, something, you know, like a, like a memory leak problem um, won't show up in your graph immediately after you push code, you can go make a business decision or a decision to work on code based on the graphs on the wall. Another great example about whip limits uh, came from Julia Wester. I was chatting with her at DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, one day and she said, I was trying to figure out why my team was working themselves to death but not getting anything done. By implementing whip limits, we were able to focus on our work. Finishing work feels better than sprinting and feeling like a hero in the moment because it's only a moment. Now, in 2016, we decided to go even further up the stack, kind of taking a look at the fuzzy front end. So here, uh, we took a look at gathering, broadcasting, and implementing customer feedback. So how many times do we work on things and wonder where it came from? Who actually cares about this? Did this come from the customer? Um, do we understand why we're doing what we're doing? Uh, we also took a look at splitting work into small batches. So decomposing that work into small bite-sized pieces that we can work at that enable that small single piece flow through the system and then making that visible all the way through the process. Um, these we've, we've called lean product management. All of these contribute to these things. Um, identify, again, strongly with uh, the organization you work for, um, a strong organizational culture, and higher levels of IT performance. So I keep alluding to this organizational culture. So take a look at this. This is based on the work of Ron Westrom. He's a uh, sociologist who actually works in um, areas like healthcare and uh, nuclear, nuclear power, areas that are high risk, very complex. And he suggests these type of, it's a typology where high, um, high trust and information flow is very important and it predicts what happens when things go wrong, which is perfect for technology. So we found that this is very predictive of IT performance and organizational performance in tech. So read through these. Who here has a friend that works in a pathological organization? Low cooperation, again, just your friend. Who in here knows somebody, has heard of someone that might work somewhere that's, that's typified by low cooperation, messengers are shot, responsibilities are shirked, bridging is discouraged, Failure leads to scape scapegoating and novelty is crushed. Maybe, okay, a few hands. Um, who here knows someone, or has heard of someone that works in a bureaucratic organization? Modest cooperation, messengers are neglected. Narrowly defined responsibilities. Bridging is tolerated. Failure leads to justice. And novelty can lead to problems. Okay. Who here? Know someone or is lucky enough to work in, a, uh, in an organization. Teams with high cooperation, messengers are trained, risks are shared, bridging is encouraged, failure leads to inquiry, and novelty is implemented. <coughs> okay, a few hands. Uh, we find significant differences among high, medium, and low performing teams. You can probably guess which way those go. We also see about um, one third of respondents across the data set in generative organizations or generative teams. 55% um, in bureaucratic and 15 to 20% in pathological. Now, in 2016, oh, and by the way, that's across all three years, 2014, 2015, 2016, we've kind of stuck pretty constant to that. Um, you can measure that with a six to seven question study, and I see several teams measuring that quarterly or, or twice a year right now to measure their teams, because we do know that as, as teams start fighting, as culture starts breaking, technology starts breaking as well. Um, so 2016, we moved on to identity as well. Um, because we do know that identity is a pretty good proxy for, um, um, or is, is at least a really good indicator and a good predictor of um, how you um, will continue to contribute to your team and um, how loyal you are likely to be to your organization, which is really important nowadays, particularly because um, recruiting for engineering talent is so difficult right now. So these were some of the questions that we used. Um, it's been adapted from um, an MISQ paper. So this is also pretty close, and it correlated really highly with the uh, employee NPS score. If you guys have ever heard of NPS. Uh, by the way, there was an HBR article that showed that NPS is really predictive of revenue as well. So that's another reason we wanted to take a look at this. 
and it's pretty similar to uh, these two constructs together, culture and identity is really similar to some of the Google culture findings as well. These two combined map really, really well to the Google culture findings. So I'm <coughs> glad I chose to work for the organization rather than the company. I talk this organization is a great company to work for, willing to put in a great deal of effort beyond what's normally expected. I find that my values and my organization's values are very similar. In general, the people employed by my organization are working towards my goal, and I feel my organization cares about me. The other nice thing about this is it talks about goals, values, what my organization does. Um, this maps pretty well to things that are likely to fight against burnout. That's the other reason we included this in this year's study. Oh look, Google team performance. Um, so Google studied, they've studied their managers for years. They have about 37,000 people they've studied in engineering. And for years they only studied the managers, that was 1,000 people. They decided to study the, their IC, their individual contributors, that was 36,000 people. Um, they expected to find like the magic mix of what would make the perfect team. They thought, I'll find like a Node.js programmer, and an R programmer, and a project manager. It's gonna be perfect. What they found? Not that. Didn't matter. It all came down to team dynamics. The number one thing far and above was psychological safety. So um, we actually included in the 2016 study, we included, um, we turned this into survey questions. Uh, we included a latent construct based on Google team performance. Turns out it didn't work. And it didn't work because it split in half. The top two items loaded really strongly with Western culture. Um, it, like statistically that, kind of like hangs out with the Western, the culture items. And the bottom three items hang out really, really strongly with identity. So turns out we were capturing, we were finding the same things that Google was finding, just split in half with Western, which is trust, safety, like hanging out with those people. And the bottom three, structure and clarity, meaning and impact. I want to keep working with the people I'm working with and I know that my work is contributing back. But also, there's no ma magic formula for what makes the perfect team. It's understanding that um, I'm safe, I depend, I can depend on the people I work with, and I know that the work that I do has meaning. Um, and I think that's really exciting and really important and fascinating as well. Um, and that comes back to, or I, you know, culture. So Intuit's um, founder Scott Cook has a really great quote here. He said, by installing a rampant innovation culture, we performed 165 experiments in the peak three months of tax season. Our business result, conversion rate of the website is up 50%. Employee result, everyone loves it because their new ideas can make it to market. I really love this for a few reasons. First of all, he calls out the culture, right? Um, he said they performed 165 experiments in the peak three months of tax season. That's, that's risky. Right? I mean, how many people here perform a lot of experiments in peak high season? There are many executives that do that. But when else are you going to do it? Right? I mean, you don't, you can't perform experiments when it's not tax season. And if you do, those are not the people you want to be doing experiments on. Like, that's not your key, those are not your key customers. That's not the behavior you want to be experimenting on anyway. Not at all. The other thing that I really love, that, love about this is that he highlights the conversion rate, right? So he talks about, like, it worked, we made money, this is awesome. The other thing that I super love, though, is that he immediately goes to the employee result. We made the company money, okay, like, made my shareholders happy, this is great. I also made my employees really happy. I did right by my employees. People are happy, this is fantastic. Everyone loves it because their new ideas can make it to market. Which is great. Now, there's another great example here that I think is really interesting from Amazon. Um, who here, I'm sure we've all shopped on Amazon, right? Have we all seen the little recommender thing on the shopping cart as we check out? This is a great story. Um, so as we go to, like, to the grocery store or a convenience store at checkout, there's like magazine, gum, and sweets, which is awesome and awful because um, we get sweets every time. But it works because we're trapped, right? I can't be like distracted, walk out, because I'm trapped. Amazon, though, not so because I can get distracted on a website, close, close my browser, or just like squirrel, walk away, happens. 
So Greg Linden had this idea. He was like, this is amazing. I'm going to write a recommender system as you check out. Coded up the prototype, walked into his SVP's office. SVP, right? Senior Vice President. Walked into his office, said, I've got this great idea. His SVP was like, cool idea. No. Super no. Because if you get distracted, we are going to lose shoppers. And Greg's like, but uh, no. This is how it works in my head, right? Walks out of his office. <clears throat> his SVP's office goes back to his own office, codes up an A-B test, pushes to production. <laughs> for real. Um, leaves in a few weeks-ish, I think, for amount of time. Finds out that it increases revenue by a few percent, which at Amazon scale is millions of dollars. Goes back to his SVP's office. The SVP isn't like super happy, but also millions of dollars. So he's like, okay, do the thing. And this is what Greg writes. I think building this culture is key to innovation. Creativity must flow from everywhere. Whether you're a summer intern or the CTO, any good idea must be able to seek an objective test, preferably a test that exposes the idea to real customers. Everyone must be able to experiment, learn, and iterate. <coughs> Don't raise hands. Who here would be able to code something up, push to production, when your SVP just said no? Who has that culture? But also, who here has the technology stack that would allow you to push to production in a couple hours and know that if it didn't work out, you could push a JK to production in a couple hours? DevOps lets you do that. It provides the technology, it gives you the practice, it gives you the culture to enable all of these things. And it gives you the telemetry, it gives you the data to be able to capture this and understand and know what the impacts are. That's power. So here's what we've covered today. Times and IT have changed. We know that DevOps is good for organizations. We have the data to prove it. And it's not just me. Now we're starting to see studies come out of Harvard and MIT that are showing this. And it's, and it's interesting because like, so many of us in this room, we know this, right? Like, yeah, this totally makes sense. This flies in the face of decades of research. So this is really, really exciting. We are in exciting times right now. It's good for organizations. DevOps is good for IT. Now we know what drives this change. It's technical practices, it's management practices, and it's culture and identity. But we have to have all three. If we do any one of these without the other, it's going to look a lot like the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And that's why we get so much um, you know, funny faces from our execs when we go to them and we have that magic bullet. Because it's not the magic bullet, right? We have, it's going to be hard work. But now we know what it takes. Um, if you want any more information, um, I've got an ROI paper coming. Um, and you can get peer-reviewed research or any of the State of DevOps reports links to them um, at devops-research.com. And we've got some time for Q&A now. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Got one up here in the front. Here, this one. We've been working on that one. Thanks. Um, John O'Farrell, I'm interested in the culture aspect for DevOps. I hear that talked about a lot. Is that something that's often already in the organization? I mean, they're kind of they've been in that vein, or is that something that as they've made this transition to DevOps, or as they come with Agile or Agility first, or is it something that's just kind of purely coming in as they, you know, adopt the DevOps capability, I guess? Thanks. Um, so, all of the above. So, sometimes you, you walk into an organization and the culture's already there. Sometimes you step into an organization that's trying to undergo this transformation and you realize, that, like, they're way back on the pathological end. Um, and there are several pieces of culture that are important, right? So there's the Western one that I talked about, which is high trust information flow. There's the climate for learning, which values learning and realizes learning is an investment and not a time sink. Um, collaboration and, and realizing that, um, or at least an acknowledgement that interactions between dev and ops and infosec and test and QA needs to be win-win. 
um, there's overall job satisfaction and enabling and, and equipping people with the correct resources and taking advantage of the skills and opportunities to do their job, right? Those are really kind of the key, probably four, I would say. Um, it's it's some of everything, right? So if, you, if you're working in an organization where like, so those things that I just said kind of resonate and you're like, yeah, we're, we have a little bit of improvement but we're kind of on the right track, you're probably pretty good, keep fostering that. But if what I just said, you were like, not at all. Work on building that up, right? You really need to be working on things like, like cliche buzzwords ahead, right? Breaking down silos, fostering communication, finding ways where taking risks is, and, and some failure is okay as long as it's like within bounds and, and everyone trusts each other and you understand that um, like when you took those risks and when you failed, it was because you really thought it was the right move. Does, this, does that make sense? DevOps has been around for a number of years now, so does your research tell you what, what kind of percentage of organizations are actually achieving those kind of results that you talk about? So I, I don't do research in where the hype curve is. Gartner says that we're at the peak of the hype curve, which I sort of love you, Gartner. Um, I take that a little bit with a grain of salt. It, I think it depends on where you are. Um, there are some organizations I talk to right now um, when I work on assessments, and and they, you know, some of them have not. This is nowhere on their radar, right? Like they are still way back in in legacy code days, and they don't know where to go with culture, and they are nowhere near continuous integration, let alone continuous delivery, and they don't know anything. They've never heard of like direct based development, right? Like they have not heard of the games project. Like this is nowhere near their radar. There are some that. Um, they're like, don't, you can come in the room, totally want your help with this, don't say the word DevOps. Like, we're completely comparing it. Like, the execs don't want to hear the word DevOps. So say technology transformation and technology initiative, but you can't say DevOps. And then, so I'm also, I also have an academic app where I publish academically, and I still, you know, I, I was tenure track a few years ago. And in academia, like, they're barely starting to use they're, they're barely starting to understand that DevOps is the thing, and that's in the last two years. So it, that's completely a non-answer. It depends on who you're talking to. But it's, I think, I don't think we're at the top of the hype curve like Gartner says. I think we're still a couple years out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a couple of times that uh, psychological safety in those elements correlated with uh, Western culture uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. um, are there similarly effective but uh, different things that you see in other cultures, or is this a particular element that correlates with uh, with these successful teams, or what does that look like as you start to look at uh, non-Western countries, non-Western teams? Um, so I haven't um, I haven't measured uh, national identity culture items yet, um, but I haven't seen I haven't seen significant differences by country yet. But I also um, most of my data sample right now is, is predominantly um, United States and EMEA so far. Yeah, that was my question. Have you seen DevOps to work in a highly regulated industry? Yes, quite a bit. So um, I, I was just, um, I've just been working with a with a large uh, financial services firm, uh, actually a couple. So I've seen it work quite well in um, a couple of banking areas uh, and telecom, which is another highly regulated environment. So is that kind of clash between the regulation, this obviously a clash between the regulation and innovation. 
Um, so there isn't necessarily a clash um, between innovation. There are there are certain times where it can it can be perceived as a hurdle, but there are also other times where um, this this is really a, a benefit. So there are like things like SOX compliance and PC like PCS um, or PCI, um, where the thing is that like, you decide as an organization how you're going to comply, and then you and then you do what you decided you were going to do. So sometimes it just means going back and redeciding as as an organization, like resetting up, reestablishing, redefining what it is you're going to do. Um, the other thing that's really nice is that by um, by automating as much as you can, you have then created audible systems and audible records that are then faster and enable more uh, more innovation and more speed. Because the more manual processes you have, the more change approval boards you have, the more it slows down the process, and the more manual stuff that you have, the more opportunity you have for error, and the less the less audible you actually are. So we actually see several um, several financial services firms. Um, several telecom companies being really innovative in this space um, because they, they realize the opportunities that are there and the better they can take advantage of this and leverage this, um, the, the better opportunity they have to get ahead of all of their competitors. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm curious if you've seen any correlation between sort of when DevOps becomes really effective and um, related to company size. There's always this question, you know, hey, I think that DevOps is um, really great, but I don't think that's really necessary until I get to X number of employees or an engineer's a team of this size. Have you seen anything in the data that you've um, done? So I, the last time I took a really, really in-depth look was the 2014 data, and there was no statistical significance at all. Um, I just recently took um, a very quick look at the 2016 data, and it does look like there is um, uh, there is some difference. Um, where now I don't want to say that there's. So just say it again. I don't want to say that there's um, like you don't need to pay attention to it until you get to a certain size, um, but it does look like larger organizations are less good at IT performance. Is that the right way to say it? There, there is a higher likelihood of larger organizations and enterprises being low IT performers in the, in the latest data set. I will also say that between 2015 and 2016, like, they kind of like, apparently do it this way, because we were even left to right, was like, like People are checking along, 2014, 2015, 2016. Like the high IT performers took off. 2014, 2015, kind of got better. 2015, 2016, skyrocket. So that's the other thing, right? Like if you want to be getting better, you need to keep getting better. Because there is no like, I'm going to hang out. I'm going to take a year off. It'll be fine. Everyone's just hanging out. Super no. So I'm not entirely sure, because I haven't had time to take a huge look at it this year, um, but, but 2016 was the first year where I've, and I just took a super quick look in the last couple of weeks because someone shot me an email, so I was like, I haven't looked yet. Holy cow. Because my first email back to them was like, I don't know, I haven't looked, but I know the last time I looked there wasn't really a big difference. Let me check, let me check. It's like, holy cow, there's a difference now. And it could be because the 2015 to 2016 year jump was, was huge. One more, and then time. One more than time. Sorry, last question. Yeah, sorry. And then you can find me after, on the way to lunch. So on the topic of high performance uh, teams and organizations, uh, are there, do you see any emerging organizational patterns or technology stack patterns that may have set to that high performance? I don't have data on that. I mean, we can chat, we can chat story. We can talk story, but I don't have data. Okay, thanks everyone.